Hello, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. I'm Sanjum Sangari, and this episode's topic will be the recent discovery of a decline in the prevalence of the Y chromosome in genetics. With me today, I have Dr. Jenny Graves from La Trobe University, a recipient of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science in Australia in 2017 for her work studying the evolution of genetics and its prospects for the future. Welcome, Dr. Graves. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. You're very welcome. I'm happy to be uh, on your podcast. I hope it's fun for everyone. Yes. And before we begin, I think it is important for the audience of our podcast to get to know the basics of the human chromosomes uh, in relation to genetics a little bit um, as we begin the podcast. So basically, what exactly are chromosomes and what functions do they have uh, in the human body? Well, chromosomes are actually what we see when we look down the microscope. But what they actually are are parts of our genome. So our genome is about one meter of DNA stretched right out and it's divided into 23 bits. And those bits uh, get contracted with proteins at uh, cell division so we can actually see them. Because DNA is so thin you really can't see it, but the, the bits of the genome compacted with, chroma, with uh, proteins at division are what you see when you look down the microscope. But essentially you're just looking at part of that one meter DNA genome. And we've actually got two genomes, one from mum and one from dad. So we've got two copies of every chromosome, two copies of chromosome one, two co copies of chromosome two, et cetera. Right, uh, thank you for the explanation. And uh, now getting into a little more detail of your area expertise, um, what is the Y chromosome specifically? Um, like what is its function in genetics and why is it the only chromosome that's not necessary for life? Well, We've got 23 chromosomes and uh, most of these chromosomes, all except one, there's two copies of, one from mother, one from father. But the sex chromosomes are special because the sex chromosomes um, are the same in females. We call it the X chromosome, uh, but they're not in males. So uh, Females have got two copies of what we call the X chromosome. So it's just an ordinary chromosome. It's got a, a more than a thousand genes on it. Uh, and it's probably a few centimeters of DNA. Uh, but males are rather special because they have only one copy of the X chromosome, which is extremely rare. And they've got this little tiny pathetic little Y chromosome. And it's much, much smaller and it's mainly made out of junk DNA. There's hardly any genes on it. But we know it's very important because it's one of these genes determines that you will be male. So one of the genes on the Y chromosome, it's called the SRY gene, and it turns on other genes in the embryo that make a testis in the embryo. And the testis in the embryo makes hormones. And it's actually the hormones that make the baby a boy. Right. And so you described that um, specifically the uh, Y chromosome, the male Y chromosome, um, only has this one specific function. Uh, is that true with the other specific sex chromosomes as well? Or are, they, uh, are the other ones more generalized? I'm not sure quite what you mean by other ones. I mean, in uh, humans and all mammals, we have X chromosomes and Y chromosomes. So the X is kind of the normal chromosome with lots of genes on it that do all kinds of, of things. It's not at, at all dedicated to sex. So it's the Y chromosome, which is a strange one. And we know it actually evolved from a copy of the X chromosome and somehow or other it lost almost all of its genes. And the only important gene is the SRY gene that makes you male, but there are something like 45 other genes on it. And some of these are important for making sperm. 
So the Y chromosome is rather unusual and it seems to be rather dedicated to uh, male functions. And that's not too surprising because it's only ever in males. Right. And um, originally you met, you talked about uh, the evolution of the X and Y chromosomes a little bit. So uh, adding on to that, originally the X and the Y chromosomes contained um, sort of the same genes and were very similar in terms of structure. Um, but as uh, evolution proceeded, um, they, they diverged a little bit. So what caused the X and the Y chromosomes to evolve into separate, um, more diverse chromosomes? Well, that's where things get really interesting because we know that originally our sex chromosomes were just ordinary chromosomes going about their ordinary business. And there was one copy from mum and one copy from dad. And they were essentially the same, you know, little tiny differences that, uh, as there are in all chromosomes. But what happened was that the SRY gene evolved and we know how it evolved and it took over the function of determining the male sex. And once that happened, that was kind of the kiss of death of that chromosome, because once it became a male determining chromosome, it was always in a male, never in a female by definition. And what that means is that it was always in a testis and never in an ovary. And the testis turns out to be a rather dangerous place to be because making sperm requires many, many cell divisions. And at least uh, in uh, cell division, that's when mutations tend to happen. So it's um, a highly mutable environment. You get lots of division, lots of mutation, and not much repair of mutations in the testis. So that's why the testis is a dangerous place for a chromosome. And that's probably why the Y chromosome has been hit extra hard because it's always in a testis. Right, and you mentioned, um, going back, um, you mentioned how um, this like one event that happened that caused them to diverge more um, happened quite a while ago. Do you have, do you know, uh, the specific date when this change occurred? Was this like before humanity or? Oh, well and truly before humanity, because it, we share our X and Y chromosomes with all mammals or at least all placental mammals. And even marsupials share more or less the same X and Y chromosomes. But what we discovered many years ago was that the other branch of mammals, the egg laying mammals that we call monotremes like the platypus, uh, they actually have completely different sex chromosomes and their sex chromosomes are more like birds. So in fact, we, we do know that enables us to date the uh, evolution of the SIY gene and the, the start of the differentiation of our X and Y chromosomes to around about 150 million years ago. So that's long before humans evolved. I mean, humans and chimpanzees are probably separated by five or six million years. Uh, so it's way longer than that. So we're looking way back in time when we look at the origin of the X and the Y chromosomes. Yeah, but so we, that was significantly uh, far back then. Yeah, but we, we have a pretty good lead on where this SRY gene came from. It's mammal specific. We don't find it in birds or reptiles or fish or anything else. And what we discovered many years ago is that it has a partner on the X chromosome. So it's very similar to this gene on the X chromosome, which is a very old gene. It, it seems to have nothing directly to do with sex, but in fact, it's more like brain determining gene. But we know that what happened was an accident happened to this, this gene, uh, which is called SOX3, very ancient gene that's going about its business. Um, probably what happened was a break occurred and then it got stuck with um, a sequence that pushed its uh, expression into the developing gonad. And we know that because there are actually babies born with no Y chromosome who are boys. And it turns out that this gene has been altered in those babies and it's 
been expressed in the testis, in, in the gonad, and the gonad becomes a testis. So all it took was just a little rearrangement of this ancient gene, which was building brains and, and it was uh, required for making sperm, but it didn't do anything about making the gonad a testis. All you had to do was to put another sequence in front of it that drove it into um, making a testis. So it's a very, very small change with a very, very big effect. And so that changed the SOX3 gene into the SRY gene. And that's really what got everything going in mammals. Right. And that must have been a very revolutionary discovery um, when it was made. So um, moving a little bit more into your studies, uh, as you argue in your studies and uh, some of your papers, the Y chromosome has been degenerating um, quite rapidly. And if it continues degenerating at this rate, um, it will completely disappear in uh, 4.6 billion years. So um, a while, but still um, it will uh, dwindle out. So what do you think is the cause of this degeneration that has been uh, found in the Y chromosome? Well, it's 4.6 million, not billion years. Oh, right, million. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I mean, don't get too worried. It's still a long, long time, but uh, it's not billions of, of years. And um, the reason, the way that I got to that was knowing how many genes was on the original Y chromosome, which is the same as our X chromosome, and that's more than a thousand. In fact, it's about 1600. And there's only 45 left. So we know how many genes uh, have been lost at 1600 minus 45 and we know how long it took to lose them because we have the platypus which never had them and that's 166 million years we divide one by the other and get to about 4.6 mil million years uh, now that assumes that the loss of genes is linear, you know, that with time, the, the, the more time you have, the more loss you have. And it's almost certainly not that way. In fact, it's, it's very variable. In some mammals, it actually has already been lost. And in some mammals like humans, it seems to be really rather stable. So there's a, a huge error there. And so it might be next week and it might be never. Uh, but 4.6 million years is, is the calculation if everything were linear. Now, the reason why genes get lost, people actually write books about that. So, um, I, and I've already explained what I think is probably the major thing, which is the Y chromosome is very vulnerable to mutation because it's stuck in a testis all the time. So whenever you make sperm, you've got a high mutation rate of all those chromosomes, but the poor old Y chromosome is always in a testis. It's never in an ovary. So it gets hit at a much higher rate than other chromosomes. And we think that's probably one reason why it, it uh, has lost all its active genes. But the other is that it can't really repair itself. You see other chromosomes, you can get a mutation up here and a mutation there, but uh, when the chromosomes come together, when you're making eggs or sperm, you can actually cross over from one to the other. So you can get the good part of one and the good part of another. Well, you can't do that with the Y chromosome because the Y chromosome doesn't pair with anything. So the poor old Y chromosome is all by itself and it can't repair itself and it has a high mutation rate. So we think that those two things make it particularly vulnerable. And there are lots of other reasons where we think that the Y chromosome is more frequently hit, can't repair itself. Right. And are there many theories that um, sort of highlight the degeneration of the chromosome? Or is it mostly, uh, or is the thought process on this kind of topic mostly uh, like streamlined that like everyone um, sort of believes this to be as the convention? No, that's actually not the convention. The convention, and people have been talking about this for decades and decades. Um, the convention is that what's the problem with the Y chromosome is it because it doesn't 
recombine. Um, if you have a population of Y chromosomes and some are more mutated than the others, once you've lost the Y chromosome, which with the fewest mutations, it's gone. You can never get it back. And that's not the case with other chromosomes. Uh, and so that's called a sort of a ratchet, you know, once it's lost, you, you then have the next lowest number. But once that's lost, you rash it up again. And so you're always increasing the load of mutations. But the other theory that's been very popular for decades is uh, what's called hitchhiking theory. And that is with a whole bunch of Y chromosomes. One Y chromosome might have a gene on it that say makes better sperm or bigger sperm or more sperm. And that is going to be so important that will drive that Y chromosome into the population, even if there's a whole bunch of mutations on it. So you can see that all these things are going on. It's actually quite complex. And that's why I say that people write books about uh, the Y chromosome and the degeneration. So it's absolutely fascinating to look at. Right. And um, talking a little bit more about mutations um, now that you mentioned. So do these mutations to the, the Y chromosome and other chromosomes happen um, pretty consistently or is it like a once in a, uh, a once in a blue moon thing that we see a mutation that sort of takes over or becomes more prevalent in uh, a specific chromosome? Well, mutation rate is generally pretty low, but of course the mutation rate per chromosome is a sum of the mutation in all the genes. And then uh, once you increase the mutation rate because you're in a testis and you have many, many opportunities for mutation, every time the cell divides, you have opportunities for mutation. The, the load gets heavier and heavier. Right. And now moving to a little bit more about what you talked about uh, in your paper, uh, in your research, you explore a phenomenon uh, called sex chromosome turnover. And I was pretty interested in uh, this terminology and I'm sure our, um, our viewers will be as well. So could you uh, explain the concept of sex chromosome turnover and like what it entails for X and Y chromosomes uh, like through their evolution and otherwise? Well, that, that's something we are not very uh, keen on being humans because our sex chromosomes do seem to be really rather stable. Um, our sex chromosomes are pretty much the same as a chimpanzee's sex chromosomes, although the, the chimpanzee has lost more genes than we have. Um, gorillas have actually lost more again, and they seem to have gone on their own way, and that's really quite quite recent. So we don't do turnover. But as soon as you look outside of mammals, you see all kinds of turnover. Um, I work with a group at the University of Canberra on lizards. And lizards, uh, these lizards like birds have completely different sex chromosomes. It's not the, uh, the male that has the X and Y, it's actually the female so we call it Z and W rather than X and Y. So the, the male has got two Z chromosomes with lots of genes on it. The female's got a single Z and a W chromosome with hardly any genes on it. So uh, we have been looking at this particular lizard and we've looked at um, the sex chromosomes, which are Z, W sex chromosomes. And then we've looked at a whole lot of other lizard species that are actually very closely related. And we see all kinds of different sex chromosomes. We see um, other ZW chromosomes that are not homologous at all. We see XY chromosomes. And we see that some species don't have sex chromosomes at all. They do it by temperature. So us mammals are very stodgy. We just have our X and our Y, and we kind of think that everybody else does too. That's not the case. As soon as you get into reptiles, you see all kinds of sex chromosomes, and you see that closely related species have different sex chromosomes. So that must mean that new sex chromosomes have taken over quite frequently. We have something like 17 species in a phylogeny of what we call the bearded 
the dragon lizards. And there's at least four uh, flip-flops of sex chromosomes within just a couple of millions of years. So they seem to be a lot more flexible and things seem to happen much more quickly in reptiles than they have in mammals. Right. And so is sex chromosome turnover and like the sort of flexibility uh, of chromosomes that you've, uh, that you've described in reptiles and other uh, species, is that something that um, these species evolved as a trait to uh, benefit them or is it just uh, mutation? that sort of occurred, which is why it, uh, we don't really see it in mammals? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, you, you wonder what flexibility would do for it. Uh, and there certainly is flexibility. The, the lizard that we, we work with, which is called the central beard dragon, it's a pet species, um, actually does it both ways. So it has ZW chromosomes, but also if it's a hot, all the eggs hatch into females. So presumably there's some sort of um, environmental uh, control of sex determination, which actually overrides the sex chromosomes. Now, is that an evolutionary advantage or not? As the world gets hotter, it probably is not going to be an advantage because we are going to end up with a whole bunch of female lizards and no males, and that isn't going to work very well. So I'm more of the uh, opinion that you know, these things happen because you get into an evolutionary tight spot and you can't really get out of it. So I'm not sure that it's a trait that's evolved specifically to help the creatures. Um, it just seems to be that because there's this flexibility, we know, for instance, that uh, having a temperature override can actually cause a complete flip-flop of genetic to, to temperature uh, sensitive sex determination. And this is probably why you can get such frequent flip-flops because you can always go through a temperature sensitive phase. Then a new sex gene will evolve on some chromosome or other and that chromosome will develop into a ZW or an XY system. So I think there's a great deal of accident in all of this. Yeah, and when you mention um, that uh, certainly the, the factor of accidental purposes would uh, be something that caused the reptiles to have this sex chromosome turnover, um, do you think the reason that we haven't seen it in males is also or in, um, sorry, mammals, is also sort of an accidental thing? Or is there something that's directly preventing uh, mammals from experiencing this uh, phenomenon? Well, I've given that quite a bit of thought and I've never really seen it discussed, but it seems obvious to me that one thing that makes our system very stable is that we can't do temperature sex. And we're stuck at 37 degrees, bad luck. Uh, and so temperature sex is not going to work very well for mammals or birds for that, for that matter, which are homeothermic. Um, and so I think we're stuck with our system and we've got to make the best of it. And that's why uh, the Y chromosome has uh, degenerated over such a very long time. But in fact, there has been turnover. There are two groups of rodents which have actually lost the Y chromosome. Uh, there's the mole voles in Eastern Europe, and there's the Japanese spiny rat in, in Japan. And both these groups of rodents have actually lost the Y chromosome. So it's fascinating to see, okay, what next? They're still there. They still have males and female pups. So mm, there must be another sex determining gene somewhere. And of course, we'd love to find out who's the sex determining gene here. Uh, is it a new gene? Um, is it a gene we've seen in reptiles? Because it's you know essentially the same biochemical pathway that does sex in in all vertebrates. And so usually, what you see with we've got something like you know thirty or forty different sex determining genes. If you look at all reptiles, all fish, and everything. Um, and they're mostly genes which are involved in testis determination or ovary determination. So it, it, there's a lot of choice there. 
uh, but we don't know which genes have taken over. But I'm very keen to find out which genes have taken over. SRY is gone. Something else has taken over. And the process of taking over must be fascinating because you'd think that um, it wouldn't work very well to have a new sex determining gene and an old sex determining gene having a sort of a war. And it may be that these, uh, these animals which have a new sex determining gene may not be able to uh, mate with the old ones. So this may be a speciating event. And I've suggested that, in fact, this exactly what happened in mammals 166 million years ago. And then again, about 105 million years ago, when a big chunk of um, another chromosome landed on the X and Y in placental mammals. So I think things are happening in mammals, but very, very slowly. Right. So uh, when you talk about um, when you talk about like these two sort of exceptions that you found so far in the rats uh, and the voles, um, where they are, they are mammals, but they do experience um, this sort of uh, turnover with their sex chromosomes. Do you, uh, was this a, first, was this a recent discovery? Um, no, the, the mole voles is very, very old. Um, Carl Fredger discovered all sorts of weird sex determination in a lot of polar mammals. They seem to be um, rather rather flexible and not only that it seems like there is um, the, these animals of course have a very short summer to breed so they have to live fast and die fast and there's several different uh, weird things that in different mammals and this is one of them uh, another one is uh, uh, some of the lemmings um, there's actually a gene on the x chromosome which kills the SRY gene on the Y chromosome. So you can get XY animals that are fertile females. And you can do, there's a number of other mouse species in Patagonia that have the same thing. They have um, a Y chromosome that doesn't work, for instance, and doesn't uh, make males. So there seems to be all kinds of drivers to make, you know, let's have more females because that way we can grow the population quicker. So there's probably selection, very heavy selection for alternative ways of doing sex, um, which are an advantage to a polar mammal that has a very short time to breed. Yeah, and um, as you said that your discovery or that the discovery of like the uh, moles that experienced this phenomena uh, was not very recent. So um, as they are like one of the very few mammals that uh, undergo this, I'm sure that a lot of people were trying to um, study these species that undergo, or these mammals that undergo it. So um, I'm sort of asking about these studies um, when I ask that, is there anything that people have found that uh, is different with these specific uh, mammals that might have um, incited their sex chromosome turnover that uh, other mammals did not experience? Well, the, the old studies that were done with the polar mammals in Europe, um, it does seem to have been uh, just their lifestyle and the fact they have to mate and produce young in a very short time seems to have driven a lot of experimentation. Um, and this is certainly the case uh, with, with some of these old world mice in Patagonia too. Um, the Japanese rice rats were discovered more recently, and this is not my work. Uh, there's a, a, a group in Japan that does beautiful work, but they're all endangered. So they're, they're, they're three species on three different tiny little islands in Japan, and they're heavily endangered. So it's impossible to breed them in the lab and very, very difficult to work with them. Uh, that's not the case um, in the mole voles. Some of these are endemic to Russia, and I believe there's some groups now that are looking very seriously at how on earth these rodents uh, reproduce and what is the sex determining gene. Uh, so there's been a group in Germany for, for many years looking at looking for the new sex determining gene, but I've seen some recent papers with a Russian group that are looking seriously at uh, how 
meiosis happens, how, because both females and males have a single X chromosome, and we have no idea how that happens and why that happens. So uh, again, it's the exceptions that are really interesting because that's where you're going to find out not only how it works, but also get some idea into what selective advantage it might have to have such a weird system. I see. So basically um, with these uh, distinct species, the reason that they uh, undergo this um, sort of mostly boils down into their lifestyle and their, um, their environment that they, live, that they live in? Well, that's what Carl Fredger uh, proposed. And that was, you know, long, long ago. And it still seems to describe the polar mammals pretty well. Um, but a lot of it is just plain old accident. Um, one is, you know, sometimes something happens, there's a mutation or a loss. And once you've lost it, you can't go back. So evolution can't go back. It's got to patch it up in some way or another. And so you find all these weird systems. Um, there's some systems in lizards, for instance, where uh, they're female only, they don't have males at all. And that seems to be a response to a doubling of the chromosomes. So you've got weird chromosomes and you can't do meiosis anymore. And so what's left, you, you have to do things another way. So you can see a lot of these chains of accidents um, occurring that end up with a system that works and you know the systems that work are the ones that are going to win evolutionarily even if they're weird i see yeah so um moving on uh, a little bit now to uh, talking back about uh generally the human y chromosome um has the y chromosome so far um developed any sort of mechanisms uh, through evolution to slow uh, degeneration? Well, that's an interesting question because there is a claim that there's specific structures on the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome has got very few genes on it, but some of these genes are present in multiple copies. And a lot of these genes are required for spermatogenesis, for instance. And it turns out that these genes live in great big loops. So there's a big loop of DNA that looks like um, the sequence actually matches up. So what you could do is have these two sides of the loop matching up and you, there's a mechanism called gene conversion where you can convert a mutant gene into a good gene. So it's been claimed that, aha, this is going to save the Y chromosome. Gene conversion will save the Y. The only trouble is, it's just as likely the gene conversion will transfer, to, will convert a good gene into a mutant gene. So there's no reason, I mean, gene conversion doesn't know what's good and what's bad. It just swaps one for the other. It could swap um, a goodie for a baddie or a baddie for a goodie. So I frankly don't see that as being in any way a salvation of the Y chromosome. So there's really um, not a very effective way uh, to predict what kind of direction the Y chromosome will turn uh, in this sort of sense? There's a lot of theories and a lot of them have to do with uh, the population size. So for instance, we have an awful lot of humans on this planet and they're all breeding all over the place. So it's much more likely that the system will keep on going because it won't run out of good Y chromosomes. It, if we were little pockets of humans living in caves, it might be a different story. And that's probably where you get the most innovation is in small populations where something will happen by accident and something like getting rid of the Y or a new, um, X, a new XY coming in or a new gene taking over, it's much more likely to happen in a small population than it is in a large population. So again, that's probably one thing that keeps our system going is that there's so many of us. Right, so um, effectively, it's sort of a trial and error uh, philosophy when you're talking about um, evolution of these chromosomes and other functions like it. 
Yes, very, very much so. You know, whatever works and whatever works best. And of course, we're talking about um, reproduction here, which is the uh, crux of the whole Darwinian fitness is, you know, how well can you reproduce? So it's absolutely critical. And if something goes wrong with reproduction, that's going to hit that gene very hard. Um, and so things that, uh, that make reproduction less successful are much less likely to end up being the dominant one. But that's why I say in small populations, you can have an accident which does hit reproduction, but it'll still carry on because there's not much choice in that small population. And then once uh, you've got, a, say, a new sex determining gene, and once everybody in that little band has the same reproducing gene, no worries, you know, you just go on. I often wonder whether there might not be somewhere in the world, a small band of people that actually have gone through this and have different sex chromosomes. How would we know? If they have boys and girls, we probably wouldn't even know the difference. But we would know the difference if they uh, mated with another group that had our normal X and Y chromosomes because that wouldn't work very well. You'd get a lot of intersexuality, um, you'd get a lot of infertility, and that's exactly the kind of barrier that drives species apart. So that's why I think that um, inventing new sex determining genes is likely to be a speciating event. Right. And so talking a little bit more about um, another term that you uh, mentioned a lot in your, um, in your papers, what is genetic recombination? And um, you mentioned that it helps eliminate damaging uh, gene mutations. And uh, I was just wondering, why does genetic recombination help to eliminate um, damaging these gene mutations? And why can't the Y chromosome undergo this process? Well, all sorts of interesting questions that you asked there. Uh, stepping back a minute, uh, I mean, you really got to wonder, well, why do we have sex anyway? Uh, wouldn't we do better just cloning ourselves? Uh, because, you know, my genes, I can pass down all my genes to a clone, whereas I only pass half my genes down into my sons or daughters. Um, so cloning should be a really good strategy. And so people have for decades and decades have wondered, well, why do we have sex? It, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of trouble having sex. Um, it's a, a, a lot of difficulty. And the answer seems to be that recombining genes is a good thing because you're always making different combinations of genes. So sexual reproduction in humans or animals or plants or anything is thought to be a, a genetically a good thing because you're making new combinations. And um, the, the old thought was, well, new combinations are good if, you're, uh, if you have new environments to colonize. It's good to have new combinations of genes that are particularly likely to, to be effective in this new environment. Um, there's been a huge amount of, of talk and there's many, many different varieties of this kind of hypothesis. Uh, but my favorite is that probably the really important thing is making new combinations of genes that will outwit pathogens, particularly parasites. Uh, and so if, if I have a combination of genes that is very common, um, a pathogen could come and wipe us all out. And that has happened. You know, very small inbred colonies of animals are very vulnerable. There's a famous uh, example of a cheetah colony in Oregon. Um, and these cheetahs were very, very genetically similar. So similar, you could actually take a patch of skin from one animal and put it onto another animal and it was perfectly happy. So that's almost like a clone. And that colony was almost wiped out by a distemper virus that just ran through the whole colony. So it's a very good thing for everybody to have somewhat different uh, 
proteins on their cells. So pathogens might lock onto one, but they won't lock onto all of them. And that seems to be a very powerful reason for jumbling up those genes and making new varieties of new combinations of genes. I now, see. Also, uh, well, re recombination is the way of getting these genes onto the same bit of DNA. So we have two, two chromosomes, one from mum and one from dad, and they have, say, a thousand genes on them. They're the same genes from mother and father, but they're slightly different varieties. And you can have um, these two genes, these two chromosomes actually uh, pair up at a specialized division called meiosis, they pair up and you can get a crossing over from one to another. And so that's what gives you your different combinations of genes. And it's also what can get rid of mutations. So if you have a really terrible mutation here in one chromosome and here in the other chromosome, and you have a recombination in the middle, then you can end up with one good chromosome. So it's a very important way of, of quality control of the uh, genome, as well as bringing all these different combinations of genes. Right. And so, um, so far in, the, in our uh, talk, we've certainly discussed a lot about um, the past and like the evolution of these uh, y chromosomes and X chromosomes um, that have been millions and millions of years ago. So um, I guess an important thing to talk about now that we understand all of those concepts uh, concepts is um, what's going to happen in the future um, with these types of chromosomes. So um, I wanted to ask you, since you are such an expert uh, in the field, what do you believe uh, are going to be the next steps that will occur now um, regarding Y chromosomes and our research? Uh, with the knowledge that um, humanity and researchers such as yourself currently have uh, regarding your discoveries in chromosome genetics? Well, I, I suggested, I think it was back in 2002, that they, at, at the rate of loss of genes from the Y chromosome, they would all be gone in 4.6 million years. And that was really a back of the envelope calculation. Um, and we didn't actually know about platypus then, so it's really shorter than I had originally planned. Uh, now, 4.6 million years is a long time. We, have, we haven't been human for more than a hundred thousand years. So uh, uh, when I published this, I thought there was a bit of a joke that, you know, we're not really very worried about something that's going to happen 4.6 million years. I think, you know, we, we have every probability of wiping ourselves off the face of the earth in the next hundred or thousand, let alone million. Uh, but, you know, being serious about it, I, I guess, you know, what are we going to do about it? Well, there's really not a lot we can do about it. Um, probably the more pressing problems are fertility. Um, the, you know, it's, it's clear that there are a lot of men who have damaged Y chromosomes that lack fertility genes or have mutated uh, fertility genes. There's a lot of rearrangement of the Y chromosome. Many people um, have deletions of the Y chromosome that are missing critical genes. And uh, what do we do? Well, we do IVF or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Um, we perhaps ought to think about that because what we're doing is we're uh, carrying on the Y chromosome that is producing problems. Is this going to um, come back and bite us one day? Uh, because we're going to have more and more of a mutational load if we, uh, if we allow um, this Y chromosome, which can't really survive on its own, if we help it survive, you know, is that a good thing or not? So I think we do have some more immediate problems than running out of the Y chromosome. Running out of the Y chromosome, I think, is, is something that is going to happen in 4.6 million years if humans are still on the planet. And at the moment, I'm not sure that we, we're doing a very good job of remaining on the planet for other reasons. <laughs> yeah. And um, sort of touching back to something we discussed a little bit um, in the earlier parts uh, of our interview, I sort of wanted to go back to that a little bit. So using current or developing technology that we have 
or that you think we may have in the future. Uh, can scientists semi-accurately or um, any, um, any amount uh, accurately predict the direction that evolution will take in these chromosomes, uh, like in the near or distant future? It's really, really hard to predict because everything, uh, there is so such a variety of the kinds of mutations there can be, uh, and they're happening all the time, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, the whole human genome project, it's all about recognizing mutations which, uh, which give rise to disease states and hopefully doing something about them. So I think, you know, that's a much more immediate problem than, than sex chromosome evolution. Uh, I think sex chromosome evolution is a little bit beyond our control at the moment, but who knows? I mean, I've often toyed with the idea of it would be kind of fun to make sex chromosomes in, in something like a fungus uh, that, that doesn't have sex chromosomes. If we know what the sex determining gene is, can we actually make sex chromosomes and watch what happens to the Y chromosome? Uh, so it seems to repeat itself over and over again. We look at, at a lot of insects have X and Y chromosomes. The Y chromosome has done the same thing. And Drosophila has done it very quickly, just a million or two years. And you've lost practically all of the genes and you have all these mechanisms that evolve to um, compensate for the lack of, of two copies. So things ha can happen very fast in insects. And it's fascinating to study it. Uh, and there seem to be rules, general rules, but there's so much variation that predicting is really, really difficult. Yeah, and what you just mentioned actually is really interesting where you talked about um, sort of how, like with regarding evolution, you um, or scientists and researchers can sort of change certain parts of an animal's chromosome to see whether it affects others or how it affects others. So I guess I was wondering, do experiments uh, such as that exist today? Like, do people do things like that? Or is it sort of on a ethical border or something? Uh, well, similar it's, to that? it's certainly been very important to look at the function of genes um, by altering them in mice. So mouse is as I really our only mammal in which we can easily uh, change genes and see what happens. So for instance, the SRY gene, the proof that it actually is a sex determined gene um, was first of all, that there are mutations in the natural population. So there are women with an SRY gene that has a mutation in it, but also just as important was manipulating that gene in mice. Uh, and if you take that gene away, uh, the mouse is female, even though it's got a Y chromosome. And if you add this gene to an egg with two X chromosomes, you can make a male. So that kind of ma manipulation is really very old. It's been going on for uh, 30 years or so. Uh, there's probably a lot more interest now in this new technology called CRISPR that you've probably heard of, which allows you to actually delicately change a particular gene in a particular way, rather than just sort of um, throwing in uh, inhibitors or genes and hoping they'll lodge somewhere in the genome you can actually tinker very specifically with it. And there'll be some really important uh, work that we can do uh, on the SRY gene and other genes in the pathway uh, to find out exactly what they do and what happens if they go wrong. And again, I, I'm talking about mouse. So it's perfectly possible that in the next few years, we'll know a great deal more about what SRY does and how SRY does it. At the moment, uh, we've, we've got a, a, a sort of a general idea that there's a complicated pathway of genes and products and they're all interacting and SRY seems to trigger something else and trigger something else and trigger something else, but it's not simple. We thought it would be simple, you know, SRY would turn a switch and that would make a test and there you are. But there's something like 60 genes and some of them inhibit others. So 
you know, you can make a testis by inhibiting an ovary and you make an ovary by inhibiting a testis. So there's, there's this whole sort of push me, pull you uh, 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 genes that are balancing uh, out. And I think it's very important to find out about what these genes do, because we have a significant number of kids who are born with a mutation in one or other of them. And we've got lots of information from those um, those natural mutations, but we'd like to understand, uh, you know, if this there's too much of this gene product or too little of that gene product, is there something we can do about it? Right. And do you think that this is something that um, researchers such as yourself uh, would be focused on trying to achieve uh, either with like CRISPR or similar technologies um, in the near future? Is that something people are working on? Not that I know of. I think at the moment we're still in the research phase because we really don't know what these genes do or how they, they do it. And it's much more complicated than we had uh, originally imagined. But, you know, people are now starting to use these technologies to uh, mitigate uh, some very serious disease like sickle cell anemia, for instance, you've probably read about that. And uh, we've been talking about this for 30 years, but it does seem to be happening now. Right. And so sort of uh, in conclusion, I wanted to ask um, specifically about you and your research. So um, you've been doing research in this very specific niche of chromosome uh, genetics for quite some time now. So do you have any plans to study um, like with the genet with the technology that we have um, right now? Do you have any plans to um, work on or um, take part in studies that sort of deal with um, what we just described? Uh, I, I'm, I no longer have a lab of my own. Uh, but a lot of my ex-students and postdocs uh, are doing things that I'm very passionate about. And I'm very lucky to be a part of two uh, groups of, of scientists. One in Canberra is this collaboration I set up in, in 2003, I think it was, on the, the lizard. Um, I didn't think I'd ever work on lizards, but they turn out to be fascinating. And uh, so uh, that that work is going fantastically well. I think we have a wonderful uh, model there in which we have genes and the environment uh, that are, are feeding off each other to make an animal either male or female. So I think we're going to be able to make some big discoveries there. And I'm also part of a group uh, that's centered in Adelaide, which is where I happen to come from. Uh, another of, of my ex postdocs has uh, taken over my work on monotremes, that's platypus and echidna. And they have crazy sex chromosomes and we really don't know how they work. They're, as, as I mentioned before, they're not like human and mouse and all the other mammals at all. They're more like bird sex chromosomes. So we don't know what the sex determining gene is. It's not SIY, there is no SIY, but we think we can come at some very fundamental uh, understanding of sex chromosomes and sex chromosome evolution by studying these crazy animals. I see. Um, and Dr. Graves, uh, thank you so much for appearing on our podcast. It was so interesting talking to you about um, your area of expertise. Um, good luck with all of the projects that you're uh, undertaking right now. And um, again, thank you so much for um, talking with me. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, you're very welcome and, uh, and good luck on, in your podcast career. I think what you're doing is uh, amazing and it really, uh, I, I hope it's going to inspire a lot of people. I hope it will as well. Thank you.